exhausted from the back-breaking work of cotton picking and fatigued from the emotional burden of being owned and overwhelmed by the reality that on this plantation she was constrained by the call of her master, Harriet Tubman was convinced that freedom was not a fantasy with a bandana on her head and a pistol in her hand, Harriet searched for freedom by night, uh, led by Moss and the North Star. This sojourner, this abductor on the Underground Railroad believed that dignity, that choice, that the opportunity to no longer be owned like cattle were all possibilities worth dying for. Because Harriet Tubman wanted freedom by any means necessary. This morning I've titled my sermon, Freedom City by Any Means Necessary. But see, we've got to understand that it wasn't Harriet Tubman's ability to free herself that raised her legacy to the status of legend. No, it was uh, her ability to rescue large groups of people from various plantations and uh, lead everyone in the group to the promised land. See, in 1850, when Harriet Tubman tasted freedom for herself in Philadelphia, she found that the ability to go and come as she pleased, the dignity of being referred to by her name, and the reassurance that she belonged to no man but herself um, were all uh, gifts and joys and privileges that she felt had to be shared with someone else. Because as she was experiencing this freedom, when she experienced it without her friends and family, she found the freedom became a little bitter. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever had an amazing uh, dinner at a restaurant? And you look to your right and your friend isn't there and suddenly the food doesn't taste as good. Have you ever gone to a movie and you look to your left and your brother isn't there and so the funny joke just isn't as funny anymore. It's not that the food didn't taste good and it's not that the joke isn't funny. It's that the experience is different because the people that you love are not with you. So what do we do? When we experience things and we are doing that apart from our loved ones, well, we run and tell them, right? So like this past December when I went home and I told my brother, I said, yo, Cliff, you got to watch this movie called Zootopia. It's this cartoon and it's hilarious, but it's talking about race and stereotypes for kids. I felt like this movie had changed the way that I think. I felt like this movie had changed the way that I understand things. And so because I was changed and had this marvelous experience with Zootopia, I felt like I had to share that with my brother. Why is it that whenever we experience something good, we feel as though we have to share it with the people that we care about? I think the good experiences that we have generate a desire within us to share because pleasure is unfulfilling in isolation. Movies aren't as funny, desserts aren't as sweet, and conversations aren't as interesting because pleasure is unfulfilling in isolation. Now, if experiences like eating and reading and viewing are unfulfilling in isolation, then imagine experiencing freedom in isolation. Imagine being uh, emancipated from something that controlled you. Imagine being freed from something that stole your dignity. Imagine being freed from something that made you feel as though you were possessed, made you feel as though you were property. And once you were made free, you had no one to share your newfound liberation with. Experiencing freedom in isolation is unsatisfying because freedom is only fulfilling in fellowship. 
I said experiencing freedom in isolation is unsatisfying because freedom is only fulfilling in fellowship. So I asked myself, I said, Claudia, you and other followers of Christ have experienced the joys of being in relationship with him. You have been freed from the things that have stolen your dignity. You have uh, been freed from things that had control over you. And so what is keeping you from sharing with others the freedom you've found in Jesus Christ? How is it possible that you're experiencing something good and you don't want to share it with your brother? How is it possible that you've been freed from something yet you don't want to share that freedom with your sister? Uh, but God asked me back a, a way better question and he asked me, how are you satisfied experiencing freedom in isolation? I believe there are two reasons. How many reasons did I say? There are two reasons why we are comfortable experiencing freedom in isolation and we are willing to not bring others into the freedom that we have found. And the first reason is that we are afraid that we will be captured by their master. One of the reasons why we do not bring people into the freedom that we have found is because we are afraid that we will be captured by their master. Slaves that made it to freedom didn't go back for their friends or family, let alone strangers. Many of us don't bring those that are still slaving on Satan's plantations because we're afraid that by interacting with them, Satan will recapture us. We're afraid that whatever they're struggling with is contagious and I'm going to catch it so I don't interact with those that need freedom from Jesus Christ as an act of self-preservation. I'm trying to protect myself. I don't want to get back into the things that I used to do. I don't want to go to the places that I used to go to. I don't want to be locked up and bound in bondage and in slavery to the master that I used to have. And so I'm not willing to go and get you. Because I don't want to get locked up in your master, nor do I want to go back to mine. So I'm going to protect myself and I'm going to stay free right here. But see, you've got to understand that you can't make a fearless sacrifice like Vladimir spoke about if you're not confident in your God's ability to keep you free. Harriet Tubman knew that every time she went to another plantation, there was a chance that she'd be caught and hung. Historians suggest that Tubman had a quote, holy, she was quote, holy devoid of personal fear, end quote. In essence, Tubman had the confidence to steal slaves off of plantations because she had an unwavering faith that God would keep her free. Many of you are unsure that God will keep you free, so you barricade yourself behind the invisible walls of religiosity, and then you put the burden of emancipation on the pastor as though he's got power and protection that you don't have access to. It's self-preservation, and self-preservation is in direct opposition to the gospel. Luke, uh, uh, Jesus says in Luke 17 and verse 33 that if you cling to your life, you will lose it. And if you let your life go, then you will save it. Philippians tells us that Christ did not seek to preserve his life, but instead, quote, made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death even death on a cross see in order to practice freedom in fellowship you've got to fearlessly sacrifice self-preservation 
But the second reason why many of us do not bring others into the freedom that we have found and many of us are comfortable uh, experiencing freedom in isolation is because we view our promised lands as plantations. Many of us view our promised lands as plantations. Some of us are like the 10 unfaithful spies who sought out Canaan land with Joshua and Caleb and looked at the land and saw giants and uh, we said this can't be a promised land, it has to be another plantation. See, the Israelites saw the giants in the land and immediately saw themselves as grasshoppers. The word of the Lord in, New, in, in Numbers says that they uh, saw themselves as being small in their own sight in comparison to the giants so because they saw the giants and deemed the giants more powerful greater than them and because the giants inhabited the land then that meant that when they went into the land they were going to be slaves in the land but see you that is a plantation perspective see when you have a promised land perspective you see giants and you realize that the very resources that are stimulating their giantism are the very resources that God has promised you. Which means that God didn't send you to a land filled with giants so that you could be made into a slave again. He sent you into a land filled with giants so that you could see what the promised land has the potential to make you into. The promised land is only a plantation when you believe you have to work the land instead of live off the land. As long as you are simply working the land but not experiencing the freedom that is in the land, you're simply a sharecropper. And sharecroppers don't work in promised lands. Sharecroppers work in exchange for little to nothing on plantations. See, when you let the spirit of Jesus Christ work in you, you'll begin to see that your freedom city isn't another promise, isn't another plantation, it's a promised land. A promised land is where you get to live out your freedom in fellowship with other free people. A promised land is a place where you get to live out your freedom with other free people. See, the fellowship of free people is different from the fellowship of enslaved people. When you live on a plantation with other enslaved people, you, uh, you desire a kind of freedom that your master doesn't want you to have. And so when you have that desire, the other enslaved folk in your fellowship will do everything in their power to keep you enslaved. See, they'll try to talk you out of running to freedom. They'll injure you so that you can't run to freedom. And when that doesn't work, they'll just tell master that you're trying to run. But see, when you allow yourself to experience real freedom, real freedom here at Miracle City and you allow Miracle City to become your freedom city and you begin to see that you're not the same person anymore. You begin to see that you walk a little bit differently and you talk a little bit differently and you dress a little bit differently and you do things a little bit differently and you hang out with different people and you want to do different things and you're trying to grow into something greater. See, when you see that you've experienced that, if you look a little bit closer, you'll only also notice in your heart that you have received from the Holy Spirit a by any means necessary spirit. You'll see that you have a burning desire to have others experience the freedom that you've experienced in Jesus Christ. Why? Because free people are focused on how we can all get free and stay free. Truly free people, truly free people are focused on how we can all get free and how we can all stay free. And see, when freedom becomes the heartbeat of your fellowship, you can walk into lands filled with giants and see an opportunity rather than misfortune. 
because a promised land or a freedom city is a community where former slaves align with one another. They support one another and they encourage one another to stay free, right? A freedom city is a community where former slaves align with one another, they support one another, and they encourage one another to stay free. I said a freedom city is a community where former slaves align with one another, they support one another, they encourage one another to stay free. And see, when freedom becomes the heartbeat of your fellowship, this is what you do by any means necessary. This is why our community groups at here, uh, here at Miracle City are so important. See, as we experience freedom together, and we are growing together and encouraging one another, the fears that we develop on Satan's plantations begin to wash away. We trade the insecurities, the negativity, the disloyalty, and the religiosity of the plantation for the transparent, authentic, hospitable Christianity of the promised land. It is this kind of freedom fellowship that when experienced in intimate community serves as the fuel for a by any means necessary approach. I can't experience this kind of freedom and not desire to bring someone else into this kind of freedom by any means necessary. See, I believe, George, that God coined by any means necessary and let Malcolm X borrow it. Hebrews 11.32 tells me about a cloud of witnesses that I believe Paul is saying had a by any means necessary spirit. See, when Malcolm X said by any means necessary, Paul said by faith. When Dr. King said by any means necessary, Esther said by faith. When Marcus Garvey said by any means necessary, Daniel said by faith. When Ida B. Wells said by any means necessary, Rahab said by faith. I promise you I'm in the word. The Bible says that lions couldn't kill Daniel and oil couldn't burn John and armies couldn't defeat David and walls couldn't stop Joshua and queens couldn't stop Elijah and torture couldn't stop Paul but wait God was committed to giving me freedom by any means necessary in fact God himself said that the freedom of heaven and a world without sin is unsatisfying to me unless I experience it in fellowship with Claudia so because of this vaginal birth wasn't beneath him the magi weren't too far from him fishermen weren't dumb to him women weren't just the help to him sin couldn't seduce him Power didn't entice him, fame didn't corrupt him, and frustration never consumed him. Because salvation was his mission, Golgotha didn't scare him, torture didn't hurt him, death couldn't sting him, and the grave couldn't hold him. On day three, I said on day three, he got up and made me free by any means necessary. So why are you afraid of capture? Why do you view your promised lands as plantations? According to Hebrews, kings can't condemn you. Exile can't silence you. Weakness can't restrict you. And the gates of hell can't stop you. See, Paul could endure torture and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ with a by any means necessary spirit because his eyes were fixed on the real freedom city. Jesus made his fearless sacrifice on Calvary not because he believed in bringing earthly freedom to the Jews in the city of Rome, but because he wanted to bring us into the freedom city that is heaven. It's not enough for you to get yourself free so that you can go into freedom city with Jesus. You must have a heart for freedom in fellowship. You've got to be like Harriet Tubman.
You've got the desire to bring large groups of people from Satan's various plantations into that heavenly freedom city by any means necessary. A philosopher said that so long as I am free, I have not yet, so long as alone I am free, I have not yet attained real freedom. So how long will you be satisfied experiencing freedom in isolation? Today, right now, who are you claiming for freedom? Who is on your list of people to go get? What plantations are you acquainted with that God can use you to rescue some people from? He'll keep you free. The question is, are you willing to go? And so I don't know about you, but today I want to make a decision that I'm going to be free from the sins that so easily beset me. But I'm also going to make a commitment that I am going to do whatever it takes. I am going to save and rescue friends, families, and strangers by any means necessary.